All right, I had it up this time. <laughs> Are you all drinking little scotch? Does, little does Andrew know. Everyone's little watching bit. this right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you are drinking scotch. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm kicking this thing off. So the other day I was interviewing Sarah Odell. And oh, I'm currently yeah. drinking Odell Brewery beer. <laughs> this is their Very sour. nice. I had she my was best friend. She was wicked smart. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, there's like smart... And then they're smart. Well, she was, was a Diana. She was Diana Glyer student. So yeah, yeah uh -huh. we bandying her name about. Well, so uh, <laughs> uh, a C.S. Lewis friend uh, who gave me my the the one who gave me the eighteen year old bottle of Macallan. Remember, I've had a little of that mm -hmm. on the show. Um, that finally ran out, but um, she bought me a a bottle of the the distiller's edition of Kalaila, the twelve year old. Mm. There was this great whiskey shop on Turtle Street. Oh, here, here we go. Oh, Ooh. <laughs> yes. Here Guys, we are, I'm trying to, I'm trying to not drink because I'm going to be going to bed in like an hour and a half. And oh, I want oh, a good oh, night's oh. sleep. Don't tempt me, guys. Oh, my you're gosh. doing it wrong. I'm just drinking oh, a little bubbly. Smell, smell, smell. Here, smell it. Can you smell it. <laughs> oh, spilled some on my screen. It's bad news. <laughs> I feel like I gotta go get some. Oh, fine, I'll go get some. <laughs> you guys chat. Oh, and well, the... tell you what, I'll introduce what we're talking about in this episode. Great. It has been a while since we've spoken about what we've been doing, because it's been a while since we've all been on the same episode. And Andrew in particular had a number of fun adventures recently. So we thought today's common room would simply be a catch up, a little bit of a life update, so to speak. Oh, what have you got there? Oh, no, Ragamore. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No idea if it's good. It was part of the good ones I kept back for myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there may be there may be treats coming your way, but you know we'll just have to see. <laughs> now I'm excited. Oh. Did I guess tell you? Did I tell you guys I gave up drinking for life? I'm done. Okay, just forward the stuff onto me. Yeah, <laughs> you have no drugs. Okay. <laughs> David's like easy solution. Mm, yeah, I'm not I'm not faced by this at all. Uh, so Matt, I explained what we're doing in today's episode. So first of all, is that whiskey any good? And what have you been up to recently? Hmm. It's very, very light, honestly. Incredibly mild. Actually, I'd say if anyone's ever wanted to try get into scotch, this is insanely mild for a neat scotch. What have I been up to? Uh, really have my life is very boring right now so yeah there's not really great life updates i had just finished phase two of that three-part big project uh so yeah i guess my life has been pure work oh i wish i could i wish i could inspire more minds i did have my mother's wedding i guess on friday and sat across from the priest because he came to the reception and it was a lovely conversation to be able to hear his story uh younger priest very steeped in the faith very conscientious and very wise and so it was, it was fun to be able to hear his story and how he became a priest and struggles along the way and all that stuff made for fun reception nice. other than that though i mean literally my life is my life is boring well, it's uh, depressing no it's play. like all yeah, it makes John a bore or whatever, however that thing goes. Well, that's like, that's me right no now. Play. Makes him out a dull boy. Yeah. That's exactly right. And I've got a couple more months. I've, phase three starts up here in, in a couple weeks after I recharge and detox from my four cups of coffee. <laughs> uh, I'm on two ibuprofen today. Oh. So I only had one cup of coffee. <laughs> oh, You're all about extremes, heart. Matt. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You have no idea. The, the first phase, I put on eight pounds. And then I lost it within like three weeks and got back to like pretty aggressive weightlifting and aggressive running and aggressive diet all to just put it back on here. Uh, that was sometime in maybe June ish. And I put it all back on in July. I think now I we're going to take it off in two weeks. I put on about three pounds, but I think it was all uh, the properly cooked, triple cooked chips at the King's Arms pub with uh, garlic mayo. Uh oh. The so problem is you just come on. home, you have the time, like you have still like two or three hours in the evening, but you come home and you're just dead tired. Yeah. And so you're like, okay, it's been 14 hours, it's been 15 hours. And then I just order pizza. Yeah. 
or I just order five guys. <laughs> it's just it's hard. The struggle is yeah. real. <laughs> uh, what did I okay. post on my Facebook today? Um, we'll say thank God for a fast metabolism. That like goes away. Ass. You just turned that thirty. It, yeah, can you hear really the gears of that going? <laughs> it really does. Yeah, that thing. It, oh yeah, just you wait. My my father. I'll put this way though. This is he ate. Um, he was not. He's not a healthy person. He ate. Now he is, but um, he ate Wendy's every day for lunch with fries until forty and never broke one seventy five. Oh wow! And, and he's six feet tall. And then finally, in his forties, he did start to get into the one eighties. So he gave up fries and he lost it all again. <laughs> so he continued having the burgers. Okay. Well, maybe you have <laughs> some of the that. fries. <laughs> what about you, David? What have you been up to? Well, I've had quite a busy life. So yeah. my wife and I, we went and spoke at the Chesterton Conference in Milwaukee. So yes. her co-host Grace came with us as well. And so we did a panel on Surprised by Chesterton, where we talked about how... Chesterton communicated truth through story and how he influenced Lewis and Lewis did the same thing. And so that was a lot of fun. Got to meet lots of people who uh, also listen to our podcast as well. And uh, the number of people who came up to me, uh, was, was, was like a secret confessional to say, I've got to tell you, I prefer CS Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, but Chesterton's I, I think what you realize with Chesterton, it's having taken a course, on both him and Lewis is just my perspective, but I mean, he's, he's very, he's not very accessible, but if you reread every paragraph two or three times, a lot of one liners are incredible. Mm -hmm. If you do finally get to understanding his point, his logic is impeccable. Yeah. And so it does feel very like bulletproof, but it takes a while to figure it out where Lewis honestly brought just as many one-liners in as much of impeccable logic and truth, but had the accessibility to it. Uh, but there is just something, I will say this, there's something fun about the challenge of Chesterton mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the sense that it feels like a puzzle or, or some sort of truth you're trying to get to the end of the maze and find, and it's masked in a lot of unique paradoxes that really twist your brain and your minds. Uh, but it's, there's just, I don't know, his wit is fun. His charm is fun. Yeah. Our friend Stephen Beebe would say that Lewis is transpositional, and that's what makes <laughs> him so audience-centered. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> well, to, to Steve Beebe, right? Mm-hmm. To Steve Beebe. Cheers, Beebe. Steve Beebe. Mm, in other life news, Alexander is now pulling up. That was one of the things that he really mastered at the Chester Ooh. Conference. You had these big conference rooms. Uh, so there was lots of room for him to crawl. So he's really started to pick up speed and he's now pulling himself up. He will probably be walking before his birthday in about a month's time. Oh, yay. So I'm slightly no terrified. Um, yeah. yeah. What is about to happen? Uh, Better move those first editions up a couple of shelves. <laughs> and a lot of things. Are, 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 I need to go like se se several shelves higher. Yes. And uh, I've also had other fatherly duties because I've had an intern this summer at uh, Evernote. And so she's just, she's just wrapped up all of her work. And, uh, that was, that was really quite delightful. It was a lot of work. Um, mm -hmm. big, you know, when you're introducing somebody to a huge code base, like Evernote's got, but she did great. So, um, yeah, to, to Simran. <laughs> Simran. I can, I can second that when I brought the employee on, uh, end of last year, I don't think I realized how much time it would take to get caught up to speed with the current code, the current process, how things work, how to fit in. It's not just like two, three, four weeks here, study this, figure this out and let's go. It's, it's a few, it's, it's maybe that period to get at least a high level, but then to get intimate with the nuances, the decisions that had to be made, uh, and to really understand market doesn't take some time. Uh, and, and it is, and you do have to invest a lot in the person mm -hmm. surprised me mm -hmm. and it was in a good it, sense, but it's it also like, you don't want to lose them either. <laughs> it, it, it was funny at the, at the end because she'd given a presentation. I said, I've done a fair amount of speaking. And so I gave her some suggestions when she's presenting her stuff to the company and Pines with Jack came up. And so, uh, I sent her the common room we had when we were talking about love languages and we learned that David mm. is as affirming as he should be. So it'll be interesting <laughs> to see whether or not she, she thinks I was affirming enough. Um, 
I'm curious not to have us go on a tangent, but what's what's the Evernote energy atmosphere culture right now being a tech company and from January at least until June, tech VC Silicon Valley was really getting hit hard in terms mm-hmm. of valuations, multiples, employee retention, stock options, companies were having to get creative, down rounds, all that stuff. Because Evernote's private, right? Yes. We're, um, well, well, so were they, I think they just did one round of funding and then they, they became profitable. So our, our so they can our, self do it. That's good. Yeah, our feedback loop is now enclosed, and so their management always have a very even hand. You know, we get our the financial updates every fortnight or so, and no, everything's still pretty healthy. Um, no, I still have a job, which that's good. I'm happy about. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> well, the big difference is the companies that are getting really having a hard time are the ones that honestly just can't get to cash flow profitability mm. to be to be just self sustainable even if you're breaking even but you're funding everything for yourself that's fine um, but there's so many that were just so dependent on outside funding to try to take an address total addressable market tam and then the down rounds are so demoralizing to employees that we're all just getting excited about their stock options going higher and higher and higher every single round <clears throat> no it's it's all very calm and then there's, that's good yeah it never um, no day has been around for a while. It wasn't mm-hmm. one of these ones that was started in 2017, 2018, 2019 and caught like the <laughs> takeoff period. No, we definitely have substance. Um, and uh, one other thing, I have started reading a new Lewis book. Uh, I Ooh. started reading Preface to Paradise Lost. So this is my oh, first time nice. through that. Really enjoying it so far. It's, it's certainly out of my wheelhouse because we are solidly in literary criticism territory. Um, yes. But, particularly because we'll be having an episode on Milton and Paradise Lost next season. I figured I should probably uh, see what Lewis had to say on the matter. Uh, And my last piece of information is I'm going to England. So the wife and I and Alexander, we will be there in October. Oh, fantastic. You'll have to bring up, bring back some VAT 69 for us. I couldn't find any in Oxford. I last time I came back from England, I, I had an empty suitcase with four bottles. <laughs> well, I went to, that is the key. Uh, went to the double decker Tesco and got some proper biscuits and oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, the, well, that's the key, David, by the way, is when you go bring that extra carry on yes, or something, yes. some way to be able to do it. Uh, I guess the one other thing I forgot to say is I'm listening to listening. I'm cranking through, uh, the Hobbit with Andy Circus. Andy Circus, mm-hmm. yeah, Circus, phenomenal. That's yeah. great. I'm loving it. Yeah, that, that, that was a pandemic one this whole time. He recorded that during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. That ah. was actually and what so, we listened to as we drove from San Diego to La Crosse, Wisconsin. We that was that was our audio listening. That's great. I, I was I had two thoughts: one not intellectual, and one intellectual. And that one was. How did this somehow get stretched into three movies? Oh, what I heard was that they were making it up as they went, that they didn't have a big plan and it felt a little uh, too compressed to do into in, in two. But that's why you have so much in the third movie. And I say this as if I've seen it. I haven't. and I don't think I will. But there's so much stuff in there that really isn't in the book. And, you know, he was just uh, I gather that he was stretching and it doesn't have the kind of cohesion that Lord of the Rings did. Well, the director had to take over, and my understanding is that they were, because the film was a mess, and they were threatening yeah. just to pull the plug on it, mm, and yeah. since he had had such good relationship with the New Zealand people, he didn't want all these people to lose their jobs, so yeah. after saying he didn't want to do it, he then took over the helm, and there's, I think there's only so much that you can fix. Yeah. yeah, it's regrettable. That makes a lot more sense, because I'm like, I'm loving this, this is great, this doesn't seem near as much substance as the three Lord of the Rings. Yeah. That was just three no, movies. True. So I'm literally true. thinking to myself, it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a much smaller subset in terms yeah. of, it's a beautiful story, <laughs> but how they made it the exact same length is that trilogy well, was just mind blowing to me. I'm going to watch the movies after. Yeah, that. no, it's, um, and what do they say? Don't ever judge a book by its movie, um, <laughs> or movies. So, yeah. Well, but now my, my one curious question was, what did you guys make of, the ring is the thing they're trying to destroy. It's the thing that, like, eventually, in Lord of the Rings, it's, it's, that's what they're eventually. trying to do. Eventually, yeah. Lord of the Rings. It's mm-hmm. dangerous. It's bad. It's it corrupts all this stuff. 
but it's a tool used along the way to get to its destruction. I was thinking about that with the, the Hobbit. I don't know why I didn't think of it with the Lord of the Rings. So like, how, how do we make that analogy in our own life? Like the ring represents what power, greed, corruption, addiction, um, is there, addiction. Is there like a point where, well, it's it, it, Lewis says that I think in mere Christianity, um, that the more power a thing has, the more potential good or potential evil, right? Mm -hmm. A cow can do only very little evil. Um, a dog can do much more good or much more evil. A man can do much, a, a human can do much more good and evil, and an angel can do almost infinitely more good and more evil. And so you have this power that's created. And it's, yes, it's created by Sauron, but it's power. And power, power must come from Iluvatar, from Eru, from the, the One. Um, and so uh, this power, you know, it's not necessarily the power. Can you say here? Oh, no, he just dropped out. Andrew, uh, <laughs> if you can please refresh the page. Something just dropped. What do you think, David? <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. Uh, I'm going to just point to the uh, order of events. No worries. Welcome back. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to point to the order of events. Tolkien hadn't written The Lord of the Rings when he wrote The Hobbit. Uh, right. Lord of the Rings was the Hobbit, the new Hobbit, Hobbit 2, yes. Hobbitier um, and bigger and louder. Um, <laughs> and so real. he didn't know that what the ring really was when Bilbo right. found it. And he had to and, rewrite mm, some of those chapters. Yes, he, re he rewrote You're, some of it. And even in the context of the story, so that by the time we come to the Lord of the Rings, the ring has become something far bigger. Um, and so I would say that in the Lord of the Rings, you don't see the ring being used in a helpful way anymore. There's, there's, mm. there's, I can't yeah. think of any points when um, uh, Frodo uses the ring in a good way. It, every time he puts it on, it only makes things worse. He gets stabbed and you know, people see him. So speaking of this, um, so part of my trip in England was the, uh, the Northwind Seminary's uh, Romantic Theology Oxford Pilgrimage, which is part of our coursework. Yeah, that's a hard class. Cool. Go to Oxford yeah. and spend a day. <laughs> like we had our Charles Williams lecture at the Holy Well Cemetery where Char at Charles Williams' grave. Um, but Brutal. I got to spend uh, a great deal of time with Diana Glyer. And during the course of the week, um, the, because Hugo Dyson is buried in that same cemetery, the conversation was about Dyson. And Dyson, I think, is an underlooked, underexamined character. Um, I think he's dismissed too readily. We also don't pay attention to the fact that both Dyson and Tolkien were on the long night walk. And then Tolkien left and Lewis and went Dyson carrying on job. talking with Dyson. Yeah. So, um, and then Diana clarified, I think it's damned elf or bloody elf. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Another, uh, not, uh, not another bloody elf. That was, that was the phrase I've, that was attributed to him. Yeah. Um, and, but you've, uh, you hear lots of different, uh, blue words as associated, with that. <laughs> but Diana made a fantastic suggestion and she said, maybe it wasn't the elves that Dyson objected to, but Tolkien, especially at that period in 49, he's writing about the war and he's writing the dead marshes, which are echoes of the battle of the sum. And there's this kind of hopelessness of an encroaching army. And Diana suggests that maybe part of Dyson's reaction was not against elves, but against the reality of a war. And he's dealing with some post-traumatic stress that you just don't have the language or emotional equipment to deal with um, as, a, as a man of his generation and suggests that maybe what, what Dyson couldn't stand was not so much the elves, but the reality of the war, which was very grim and going on, had just gone on all around them. And so I thought that was a, a fascinating, um, a fascinating suggestion. That has her trademark charity. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> so I have so much sh show and tell, I can't even stand it. Um, I <laughs> may or may not have broken off a piece of brick from the kilns. Um, <laughs> So There's going to be nothing of that place left by the time you're done. <laughs> Jerry Root says that he could build his own. He's carried off so much brick from the, from the beds um, during one of the... That's hilarious. Uh, it, was, it was three weeks in England, and it was characterized by people and by places and by ideas. Um, and just, it was fantastic. One of the places that we got into was C.S. Lewis's rooms. 
Wow. Now, Maudlin. this has never been done before. Well, not This now. is Maudlin, Oxford, right? This is Maudlin College, Oxford. Okay. And um, Michael Ward had only ever been in the rooms one time. So here are those huge bookcases. Um, mm. And so we got, uh, we got to go in and see Lewis's actual rooms. And we're some of the first ones to be able to do that in, in decades. So it was just an amazing experience. Um, we caught. Why have they not let Moore do that before? Because Andrew will keep just... stealing stuff of the room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh that's adorable. <laughs> just overwhelmed at being Aww. being at the place. Um, part of it, Matt, is um, the tutor who took over for Lewis, or who was in the rooms when Lewis really became very popular in the seventies and eighties, uh, really didn't like Lewis, and so he was very tired of these tourists coming up and knocking on his doors. Um, it's now a research center, and there are three or four people. And um, Professor Simon Horobin was very generous to to uh, to get us in there. Um, so it's not a tourist attraction. So we got some we got some rare privilege to to be able to go up there. Um, just incredible places, incredible people. Andrew Peterson is in Oxford um, right now, and we just kept bumping into him um, here and there, and he gave it gave a gave a great talk. Um, but it was just, well, we got to spend a couple of days, Kristen and I were a couple of days in the kilns where we recorded the Jerry Root episode. And let me just tell you that, um, England in 104 degree heat was miserable, <laughs> miserable. <laughs> Plus the pubs shut down, you know, the pubs what? like, oh, well, my the goodness. bars didn't oh. shut down, but the, the kitchens shut down. They couldn't stand the heat. Those, those Brits. <laughs> Holy well, the cow. proverb does say to get out of the kitchen. And get out, they did. Um, so that's rough. It was very mm. rough. We got to go up Maudlin Tower, and so we got to see. Uh, oh, mm. there's new buildings uh, from Maudlin Tower, and so that's also not. You were right by my apartment. Really? So my apartment was right outside. Um, it was it was on the back side of New College. And where there's kind of like a wooden open door gate to Maudlin College, not like a primary yeah. one, but on the side street. Oh, yeah. I was directly across from oh, that. Oh, no, like I know. Directly I know across. Right oh, I know the one. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so That's where I had my night terror with a snake and ran out to the, the street <laughs> oh, at 3 a.m. in my boxers, thinking there's a snake in my room. And I busted open a window. Was it actually a snake? <laughs> it's never. It's never a snake. Okay. <laughs> in my head. Oh. It is a vicious snake. Ah. So just incredible to be in England and to be in, in all of those places. We got to walk down Cuckoo Lane. Um, we visited one of the houses where Tolkien, uh, Tolkien lived. Here's us at, or there's Michael Christensen and Owen Barfield the third mm -hmm. at one of Tolkien's houses. Um, <laughs> and then we were in the King's Arms. Um, uh, oh, we got to... Uh, we got to go to Exeter. Did you do turfs? What's that? You did the turf. Yeah, we went to the turf. I love turfs. That was the spot that all the new college people would go yeah. to. The the turf was often though really crowded, and so mm -hmm. yes, um, uh, I found that. The I remember when I showed up. It, it, the reason it got really popular, at least when I was there, was because they always would advertise uh, Bill Clinton. Yeah, he used to go there when he was a Rhodes Scholar, and they said he would famously had something in his mouth. <laughs> I think they were referring yeah. to. <laughs> Weed. He didn't inhale it, but he had something in his mouth. Here's one of our buddies. Um, and the reason why he's standing there in that position is there's an old picture of Tolkien. And this is the Exeter Quad. This is where he was an undergrad. Huh. And there's a picture of him standing right there with his hand right on that pipe. So, um, And they had a bust of Tolkien there in, in the Exeter Chapel. Um, nice. so, so we just had, we got to go to. Did you do any of the Harry Potter stuff? Oh, Oh, did we do Harry Potter stuff? Well, <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it it depends on I what you Harry mean. Did stuff. you do Harry Potter stuff? So if you mean, oh, I got a Harry Potter Lego now. I think he ate in the refectory. Uh, yeah, and Paul, <laughs> not the. I refectory. guess if you did the Bodleian Library, you indirectly did. Oh no no uh, no! No, I'm thinking of the Duke Humphreys. Sorry. Yeah, uh, we didn't go. I didn't go into the Duke Humphreys. Although I do have, we got um, scholar access library cards. And I renewed mine for mm. a year, and so I got to go into the Bodleian and handle all the archives. Um, mm. But um, yeah, here's Kristen and me and Diana 
at Dumbledore's seat. <laughs> um, all right. Now, there's the high table behind us. So, but, um, yeah, I sat in Dumbledore's chair and Minerva's chair. Uh, Is Diana a Harry Potter fan? Uh, no, she didn't really know Harry Potter all that all that much. She wasn't. Uh, Man. But, uh, but yeah, it was. My just sister's re listening to all the audiobooks because of the Harry Potter language that she got me, <laughs> and she's loving them. Oh, that's great. So, we got to spend some time in the kilns, and it just, it was all just brilliant. So, um, yeah. Uh, oh, Sounds like I got quite mail the trip. at the kilns. Da, 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 da. Andrew Lazo, <laughs> Kills Lane, Risinghurst, and I received there two British first edition Narnia books. Da, da, da. Nice. British first edition, that's that's the first. Not right? the it's a first edition, not a first printing. Mm-hmm. Ah, I didn't know those were a different thing. No, mm -hmm. so the first edition, so this is exactly how the first edition looked. Um, I think I have a British first of this. Well, a true first. So it's identical to the first printing. So it's it's first just not necessarily the first printing. It's a first printing. edition. This is what, it, when it was, it, it, when the edition first came out, it looked like this. And this is a second impression or second printing of the first edition. Ah, uh. So it looks exactly the same. It's just a subsequent printing. So uh, I may. And what? How does it go? There's a certain year. Any book written after a certain year, the first editions or first printings aren't ridiculously expensive because with, they realized his popularity and started printing a lot more. With Lewis and then pre. Yeah, and yeah, and then there's like a pre era where some of the first printings are insanely like thousands because yeah. Yeah, they just don't have a lot of them. He wasn't super popular then. No, it's true. Yeah. The more popular a book, um, the more rare the first edition was, and that's one of the things I did in the Bodleian Library. I spent, um, I spent three or four days in there, three days in there, and they just I put in my request, and they just handed me folders with original letters, and <laughs> I read all of the correspondence between Lewis and his publisher Jock Gibb for 1955. And so I was looking for evidence about Joy Davidman's involvement. I'm constantly looking about looking for that. And I found out, so we have all of Lewis's letters published in Collected Letters Volume 3, but they had the publisher's letters to Lewis. And they had both of them, both of the originals right there, so I could just go through. And one thing I didn't know was um, the original line was, how can the gods meet us face to face before we have faces? Right. And that was the line in the mm -hmm. book. And then they were going to call the book Bareface, But then they decided on Till We Have Faces. And because it was Till We Have Faces, then the publisher suggested to Jack that he change before to Till. But we I didn't know that before was the word, because all we have mm -hmm. is Lewis's letter saying, right, Till, that's great. I'll make the change. So I also found two different pages of autobiography. So one was an earlier draft, a, a page of an earlier draft of Surprised by Joy with some mm -hmm. minor changes. And then one was an attempt, and I was on the, I was texting from the body and texting Charlie Starr to say, <laughs> hey, when's the handwriting on this? Because uh, Paul Ford dates the, the composition of Surprised by Joy from 48 to 53, which is the same as the Chronicles of Narnia. But um, Charlie's dating some of the handwriting to like 44 or even 42. So it goes into my thesis that I've been publishing about and writing about that Lewis was writing autobiography all the way along. And there's this page where Lewis talks about what it's like to, to write as a boy or to write, uh, to write one's childhood. And the childhood events of a biography are the most, are the most enjoyable. And I've never mm -hmm. seen this in print anywhere. And then I got to spend some time with a Lewis scholar who had done some stuff, and he had a picture of another page of autobiography that had changed. And the, Lewis started out, and he said, I was born November, 29th November 1946. He was born in 1898, but he was writing in 1946. Mm. We don't know for sure, but we're guessing, especially because I'm sending it to Charlie, and he's confirming the handwriting. And so here is this – we're – we're widening even more this thesis that I've been pushing for the last year that Lewis was constantly writing autobiography. And so I had a great conversation at the King's arms over beer and chips with, um, with Andrew Peterson about the urge to tell our own stories 
the way that we tell our own stories to kind of shape the narrative. Um, and remember that the subtitle of Surprise by Joy is the shape of my early life. My early life. So Lewis mm -hmm. is trying to find a shape for his early life. And as I suggest, he didn't really understand what his autobiographies were about until he stopped writing about joy and started writing about love. So, mm. and there was an interesting comment from one of the, um, uh, from the publisher saying uh, a letter to Joy Davidman saying, Hey, Dr. Lewis says that you may know the answer to this. There's a change he wanted to make two thirds of the way through surprised by joy. Do you remember what that error was? So she knew the manuscript so well, the publisher was asking Joy Davidman for advice on what the, what the change was. So just, mm -hmm. I mean, not any huge major ground shaking discoveries, but I hope to go back next summer and, um, uh, and and just some uh, some great stuff playing around, and you know you can smell Lewis's pipe smoke, you know right there <laughs> on, your, on your fingertips. So just a, a, a magnificent time. That's so cool. Oh, and well, we heard Michael mm -hmm. Ward twice, and he came and talked to the so he talked to Northwind, and that was great. Um, but then he came and and gave an address about abolition of man, and it's. Um, he talked about clear and thick religion, and he talked about the head and the chest and the stomach, right? And Lewis makes these distinctions in Abolition of Man. And I realized, and then later chatted with with, Spud, with Michael Ward about it, that um, that the fox is the head. Mm -hmm. And Arnom is the chest because the bird head is worn on the chest, not on the face. And the then animal. I, yeah, Exactly. Um, but then I'm suggesting that Bardia was like the belly. He was, you know, he was just kind of, you know, moved by his own physical physicality. So <laughs> anyway, lots of incredible ideas. And I came away really inspired to kind of keep writing and to, yeah, it was just, it was an unbelievable trip. And then I got COVID. So I have been <laughs> isolated here in the house for the last week. Um, we got home a week ago last I night. I think the last time, we, I think when we recorded A Severe Mercy, one of the episodes you mentioned how you made it through COVID without getting COVID. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I spoke too soon. The next I? time I see yeah. you. <laughs> oh, and that was another thing. We, were, um, we had some reference to Will Voss. Um, because we had gotten in the rooms, now we're looking at all the old pictures of Lewis in his rooms, and now we have pictures of the place. And we're trying to position where all the furniture was and everything. And we're even trying to identify the paintings. And so mm -hmm. this scholar sent me an email and he's like, okay, I can only see half of the painting over the fire fireplace. Do you know what it is? And I did a quick Google search and Will Voss has done a blog post where he actually identified it. So I got to email mm -hmm. him right back and say, here's that painting and give a shout out to Will. And so... Yeah, it was all, all coming it. together. Oh, and then on the plane back, one of the conference attendees um, had visited Sheldon Van Auken. And he showed me wow. two letters from Van Auken. I took pictures of them for you, Matt, to, to, to send you. And he, <laughs> he visited Van Auken for an, for an hour once and had a couple of pictures. So there was mm. all kinds of connections. And then we were at the King's Arms with the Pints with Jack. And hopefully you all saw the photo there. And we scattered the um, scattered the swag far and wide. and, and uh, <laughs> So lots of folks from Anselm got some, got some, uh, some stickers and things. So thank you for sending that. I love it. So, yeah. I see David knowing that we're right past 30 minutes. I can see it in his eyes. <laughs> oh man. Well, that was actually one other thing that I wanted to share with you guys because so sorry. Yeah. we're doing poetry month at the moment. And, uh, in the episode, which was just released, um, we heard loves as warm as tears and about the different musical renditions of it. Uh, Ed, when Taylor, our audio engineer, was editing it, he sent me a message, and I just want to play it for you. And I just want to Can end like that. Ah. It starts a little, Should we be starts a little quiet. I can't hear anything. Can you hear it, David? I can't hear it. I don't think David can hear us. Oh, you can't, can't hear, hear it? it? We can't hear oh, it. No, but it's, it's fun watching you bop along. <laughs> While you're queuing it up and putting it on speaker, um, Phil Keggy on his Beyond Nature album, which is the album that really um, has a nod to Lewis. He's got um, 
a song called County Down. He's got a song called Brother Jack, but he also has a song, an instrumental song on the Beyond Nature album called As Warm As Tears. And it's from that poem. So now dance okay. and play it for us, David. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I've got the the right one now. So y'all were talking about uh, loves as warm as tears being set to music, and then he started reading it, and I instantly thought of the perfect music setting for it. Loves as warm as tears. Love is tears, pressure in the brain, tension at the throat, deluge weaker brains. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. <laughs> well, to Taylor. Wow. I didn't get to, to tell you about the Book of Common Prayer that I stole from Lewis's home church, the Holy Trinity. I made a donation. Oh. I asked the vicar. I got permission, <laughs> so we had a hint. Should there. one of us drop and join the Patreon call? Yes, <laughs> we've got a Patreon call with a top tier supporter. So let's jump to right. right now. Cheers! Great. So started about cheers two minutes to ago. Taylor. <laughs> cheers. <laughs>